You okay. Have permission. There we go. All right. So welcome to the April 21st, 2022 regular meeting of the Northern California DX Club. Uh, this is our 76th year of operation as a DX club. Um, uh, I'm only a few months older than the club itself. So we should take a great deal of pride in that. Uh, I'm the master of ceremonies and I'll be running uh, the uh, meeting today. I'm the NCDXC vice president this term. And uh, there's a picture of me uh, outstanding in my field. <laughs> That is, that is me, as you all, all can recognize. And now, without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce our speaker, Ed Jenkins, K6EXY, and uh, his presentation on antenna traps, balance, and unans. So, Ed, uh, let's see if we can get you to share your screen. I'll stop sharing on my end. remind everyone except Ed to mute. Uh, Mike, it's up to you whether you want to or not. Oh, yeah, I'll mute. So do I try to put my um, thing up now or not? Yeah, go ahead and share yeah, go your screen. Ahead, you, you've got the sharing ability now, so you should be able to share your screen. Okay, let's see. I'm going to first get the uh, presentation up and... Can you see it? Not yet. Did you click OK on the share? Uh, no, I didn't see that. Uh, let me back up. Where do I? Down below, there's a share screen button. OK, got it. Click on that. Should give you a select over there. Give you a selection of screens to share. OK. Select your presentation and hit share. Ah, That's there we go. See what yeah. happens here now. We see your, I see your desktop. Okay. Are we in business? We are in business. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, now I want to. Let's see, I, you don't show any pictures partly covering my uh, presentation slide no, or not? No, my, what, what I'm seeing, Ed, is a window, a shared window. It's got nothing but your slides in it. Okay, okay, we're, we're good to go then. All right. Okay, well, uh, it is my intention to give you a little bit of background of myself, just a very slight bio. And I believe that it gives a better perspective of why I think the way I do and why I do what I do and, and so forth. So let me just very, very briefly tell you that um, I like many of you and many of, of hams that I've met of our vintage uh, started very young. I built uh, three crystal sets when I was six years old, used the toilet paper uh, center for a coil form and had big fun with that. And a couple of years later, uh, the uh, kits uh, were available and I built uh, three, three tube regenerative receivers for three of my buddies. And then uh, I got exposed to a, a really good ham. I was probably maybe 12 or 13 and saw a real good ham shack with uh, 
a kilowatt, which was the maximum allowed then on AM in those days. And so I got very interested and I, I decided I wanted to be an electrical engineer at about the age of eight or nine. So I've been in this a long time. Then, uh, <clears throat> you know, you, you grow up a little bit and you find out uh, you got to eat and so forth. But I did get my uh, first amateur license, a general in 1950. And I was 15 at the time, so that tells you how old I am. Pretty old. I call myself geezer age. And uh, then after that, I was only on the air for a short time, maybe a year and a half or something. And then life uh, came upon me and I had to earn a living and so forth and so on. So I won't go any further than that, other than the fact that I was off the air for many, many years while I was going to school and earning a living, raising a family and so forth. So my disclaimers are that I have a limited number of things that I've built and tested, and I don't have a degree in antenna uh, education of any kind, so I can't uh, make stake to any claims there with the exception of, of what I've built and tested and gotten very good results. And the reason I, I got into this is I wanted to uh, have better performance than some of these uh, videos that I saw on uh, antennas and balance and onions and so forth and traps. I had, I, I, I believe there's kind of two philosophies for many amateurs. Uh, one is, uh, give me an antenna that has an SWR of let's say two or less, two to one, or maybe three to one or less, and give me a tuner and I'm happy. Uh, not me. I want, uh, at least at the center of the band, I want 1.0 something. I want, I want all my energy to be going out the antenna. So that gives you a little bit of thought of where I come from. So because I was off the air and not doing much for quite a number of years, uh, when I got energized again to do that after retiring, uh, I needed test equipment, analyzers, parts, and so forth. You can read the chart. I don't need to read that to you. What I started doing, though, when I got a little uh, a QRP rig, I I said I don't I don't have anything, so I got a Pacific Kits antenna kit for 20 and 40 meter. And it was, um, I still have it. It's, it's kind of Mickey Mouse, but it, it was good enough to kind of get started. Um, <clears throat> since then I built a, a two band 20, 40 meter end fed vertical that requires an item of, 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 you see the impedances there. And uh, I did build that and achieve that. I used a, um, uh, let's say uh, spider, spider beam uh, pole from Germany, 65 foot fiberglass pole. It's a nice pole, but it turns out it's a little bit too bendy up on top. So I was not, it did not succeed in, in getting uh, uh, what I wanted out of that in terms of 40 meters which would have been okay. So <clears throat> uh, let me back up here just a second. I think I skipped something. Okay, anyway, I took the top of the, uh, the pole off so it wouldn't be so bendy. And uh, I built a, a, an onion for that. And you see, I got a sandy weight ratio of 1.03 to one at the, the center of the band on, on 20. So another, I also built a 40 meter folded dipole. And if you buy a 300 ohm ladder line from uh, uh, DX Engineering, you see in a fine print, it's actually 272 ohm. And so I built a Ballon 
uh, to match exactly 272 to 50. And uh, you see the numbers there. Um, then I built a 10, 20 meter dipole, which used 10 meter traps and a one to one ballon right at the feed point. And that's kind of the major thing that I was asked to talk about here tonight. And that will be the kind of the center piece, that uh, little trap and what I've done with traps since then. Now, <clears throat> I'm sure all of you, uh, you're, you're very experienced guys and I'm not gonna teach you much of anything, but these three URLs provide a really good summary of uh, what traps are all about and how they work and what's good about them and so forth and so on. So these three different URLs, and if you get a copy of this thing after, uh, after we're done, which uh, will be made available to you, I did a uh, PDF file of all these slides, so it'll be easy for you to get that. And if you wanna look up some of these uh, videos and have a look, uh, but those are three really good ones by three different guys. They all say pretty much the same thing in their own words. Uh, <clears throat> so my summary of traps, and you can read it there, very useful. And I, I strongly like them. They do narrow your bandwidth a little bit, but if you want to uh, make an antenna shorter, they they will reduce the overall length because they act like a, a loading coil in there and they add some inductance, which actually reduces the length the, of, of the wire that you need to get the frequency that you want. And uh, you see what I used. Let's go to the next chart. Okay, back to the balance and unins. Um, this, this particular URL is by uh, TRX Labs. And if you know the guy, he obviously is, his uh, first language is German. And he takes a long time to say something, but he, he does it very clearly and, and very well. It's just, you sit there and you say, please hurry up, spit it out, you know, but he's good. And he built a, a fantastic, uh, uh, not that he did anything fantastic, but he used some uh, really good ideas that other people have uh, put forth in the past and got some tremendous revolt, uh, results. So I have in here, and I'm going to run it in just a little bit, a little uh, calculator that helped me uh, as I call it, get rid of the grunt work. And you see what the program does. And I'm not going to read that to you. You can read that yourself. But basically what it does is you need to take square roots and divide and so forth to get uh, what you want in terms of uh, a non four to one, a non nine to one. All of those prescriptions are in videos. I don't want a four to one. I want a 5.3 to one or a 1.4 to one or whatever. And it's, it's easily attainable, but there are some things that you have to keep in mind. One, there's no such thing as a half a turn on a, on a uh, ballon or on an, uh, it's either a full turn or no turn. And so what you need to do is get a ratio of turns that's close to what you want to give you the transformation you want but you need to get within a small portion of one turn uh, to not go crazy with too much wire. And this tells what my little program does. And here's a program, and I'm, I'm gonna actually run it here if I can, and if you don't mind listening to a little bit, this shows you what it does. Oh, I should tell you, one of my other hobbies is uh, writing software. Uh, yeah, I was never a professional, although I have produced some pretty good stuff, I think. And uh, most of what I have written 
was for the purpose of scoring sailboat races, which is one of my biggest hobbies. I have about 400 trophies that I've collected over a, you know, a long period of time. So I, I feel very authoritative when it comes to sailboat races. So I was uh, developing uh, software. So let me run this little thing. Uh, if I click on it here, the purpose of this little application is to remove the grunt work out of calculating how many turns primary and secondary to get a impedance transformation of one impedance to another. So we'll demonstrate. Let's assume that we have a dipole with an impedance at the feed point of 73 ohms and the feeder impedance cable is a 50 ohm coax. And we want our turns, the number of turns to be within 2% of a full turn. And let's say that we don't want more than 30 turns maximum on the primary. We click and sure enough, it calculates it with 24 turn primary and a 29 per point turn secondary, we will get exactly impedance transformation from 73 to 50 ohms. And that's what this little calculator is good for. And the end of this video. Okay. So that helped me, uh, like I said, get rid of grunt work. And here I talked, and by the way, I should mention that if you look here, you'll see I gave this presentation without emphasizing traps back in February of last year. And uh, this is pretty much, I updated a little bit, but mostly I added the traps to this presentation. So if I'm skipping over some of this, uh, uh, you understand. The point I would want to make to anybody that wants to use the uh, a bifiler or trifiler, quadrifiler, quintufiler. <laughs> I have to, it's hard to remember those. Uh, is that you want the windings to be close together and then the alternate, I mean, the from one winding to the next is far apart and the actual uh, wires themselves tight together. And you see what I mean. I'm, I'm sure you understand that. Uh, so I built some prototypes with different core materials and I learned the hard way that some of these uh, um, iron powder cores are virtually worthless unless you're really working at pretty high frequencies. Certainly on the amateur bands, they're pretty much not good for much of anything. And let's see, what do we got here? Well, I don't, that's, that's kind of educational stuff. So my, my big point, what I made in the, in this presentation originally was to, to, to do what you want to do in terms of don't, don't make a four to one when you don't need a four to one. Don't make a nine to one when you don't need a nine to one, make a 5.2 to one or whatever it is you need and find out how many turns you need and do it. The other thing is wind tight around the core and nearly always you have to add a capacitor to the primary side to optimize. And uh, I do that with a uh, air adjustable and tweak it until I get just absolutely the best I can get. Okay, I'm gonna start to show some pictures now this is a beautiful piece of uh, plastic molded that holds ladder line, was absolutely perfect for my uh, folded dipole. This was a picture of a one-to-one -one, um, ballon that I use on my uh, 10, 20 meter dipole. And it's good for about 100 watts. And you can see I actually wind uh, twisted the, the primary and secondary together. 
to get tight coupling uh, between them rather than uh, uh, another good way if you could get the wires through a piece of tubing to keep them tight together and wind the same thing, but this was easy to do. Here's the uh, the five, here's what I was talking about, spacing between alternate windings and keeping the actual windings tight together. And this is, this is actually in use, I use this every day uh, for 50 to 75 ohm uh, transformation and does this was when I was tuning it up before I put it in the box, but it gave me excellent results both before and after. Another thing I did on these uh, transformers, I interleave the primary and secondary. In other words, every other turn is primary, every other turn is secondary. And when, of course, you have more secondary turns than primary, I try to distribute even number of, of turns on either side of the primary, uh, which is what you see there. Five turn primary, 12 turn secondary. Here's a couple more. Here, the point I was making here was just all you gotta do is have a single wind. This is for an auto transformer, which would be an unun. All you gotta do is tap. You don't have to do this twisting and all this other things that I've seen in a lot of videos that I think are an absolute waste of time. I've tried them both. These work just as well and are much easier to do. Now, here's, here's the star of the show tonight. This is my 10 meter trap, 15 picofarad, six kV capacitors on the inside. And that form is a 5 8 inch diameter polycarbonate. And you notice the ends are nicely rounded and uh, I don't know if, no, I guess you can't see my picture, but I, I will show you later. I use one of these pipe cutters that uh, roll and roll and roll with a sh sharp roller edge. And they do a nice job because they kind of round the ed ends for you and do a nice job there. Here's uh, the actually small compared to what I see in the videos for uh, traps. Usually they're one and three quarters, two and a half inch diameter pipe with uh, 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 coax wound around. Here's two, and these uh, pipes are a little over an inch in diameter and they're 20 meter traps. And here's my new 20 meter traps on the five eighths inch diameter. And uh, you see the scale here, you can see what size they are. And right here in the front, that's a 4.7 picofarad capacitor, <laughs> 20 gauge twisted wire. I mean, I just twist against itself to, to make kind of a mechanical support. And then, uh, you know, you can unwind more if you want a little more capacity or a little less. And this should be good for 1.2 kV or more because it's 600 volt wire, 600 insulation. Here's a little closer up. I have some wraps, uh, tie wraps on the end here. Uh, initially, just while I'm making it to hold it tight together. And here I was tuning externally. And here's the other one. And again, that capacitor. And here's how you uh, put this on your antenna analyzer works just fine for finding the resonance uh, of, your, of your trap. Okay, and here's the antenna analyzer showing the 20 meter trap. And you can see the frequency is 2114030, which is pretty good. And you see the big dip in it there. Here's the little one. And you see that's right on the nuts there. Four, right in the middle of the band. And here was another experimental with a winding primary between the secondary. And I'm a big fan of Jerry Civic and I won't go into any of this. That's not what we're here for, but he has some excellent stuff there. And I'm at, I have been able to replicate 
performance wise, most of what he says. So that makes me a big fan of his. He knew what he was talking about. The thing that I talked to you about earlier was this uh, German guy, TRX Labs. And this is what he built and talks about. And what he has here is a one-to-one -one ballon and a four-to-one ballon to do the transformation. He calls this the common mode rejection and this the transformer. And he gets fantastic results here. If you look at the return loss, 37 dB, and this is from about 1.8 to, uh, to 30 megahertz, flat as a popcorn. Okay, and here the impedance you see is absolutely flat. And this standing wave ratio is so far down in the bottom there, it's almost laying on the baseline. So excellent results. And that's the uh, what I wanted to show you there. So <clears throat> what I wanted to do was rebuild some of my conventional balance to this uh, concept that uh, Jerry Sevick talks about making them transmission line types, which gives you uh, a better performance and you can run more power through them. Now, here's the references that I spoke of on balance and unons. This is a partial list. Off to the right, I show uh, what I think should be the title of that uh, video. And you may want to look at some of those if you see something interest. This is a just a continuation of the same list. So, and a lot of grunt work went into that because I watched every one of these pretty intently, you know, uh, more than about 14 months ago, 15 months ago. And uh, that's why I came up with this list. I thought it was pretty good and somebody might want to look at it. And I have some quotes from Civic's text. And these are pretty much unbalanced. He doesn't talk about traps. This was the front of his book cover page. And this is the uh, instructions on that little calculator. I just didn't want to throw it out of this thing. Uh, I want to say a couple more things just briefly. The antenna book, which I have, uh, let's see, it's, uh, I think it's the 24th edition of the antenna book. And if you look at pages 10, 15, 16, mostly those two pages, you get a very, very good description and accurate on traps and what they're good for. Uh, the one thing that I think uh, was a big mistake in that printing of that book is they're showing coax connected without a ballon. And uh, I think that's a very, very big mistake on their part. They should have, but of course that stuff was written a long time ago. So who knows, but the uh, principles haven't changed. And uh, that's the end of my talk. Okay, thank you, uh, Ed, very much. Uh, I might add that Ed has uh, sent me a PDF of his uh, presentation slides, which contain all the links that he uh, he uh, indicated to us. And uh, I'll um, have that forwarded to Lucas. And when Lucas gets his head above water again, uh, then we'll have it posted to the website. So thank you, Ed. And uh, does anyone here on the call have questions for Ed? Now's the time to ask them. I have a question. Ed, what are you using for your boxes? Just electrical boxes? Uh, I found, I found, uh, well, the uh, initially I was, I got them all offline uh, uh, from, uh, places that were sold through Amazon. However, 
the most recent one, I kept wanting to get smaller and smaller because they're out there in the wind and weather. And, uh, you know, if they're hanging up there at the apex of the, or the feed point of the antenna, uh, the smaller I could get them, the better. And I did find some uh, smaller ones at uh, uh, this place in the San Fernando Valley. I think it's electronic parts or something like that, RF, RF electronics. I RF have, parts. RF parts. RF parts. I think I think it was them that that I got the most recent ones from that were a little bit smaller and they were pretty good. Ed, have uh, you? I have a question. Uh, Ed, I have a question. How did you deter remind me again how you determined the capacitance, uh, the capacitors that you added on? It was clear from your calculator as far as windings, core, et cetera, et cetera. How about the capacitance? Well, th that uh, if you if you watch all these various videos, you see they they don't talk about it, but they add a capacitor to the primary side, like on an onion, and you say, "What's that there for?" I can't. I I can only speculate as to what, but they tell you put a hundred picofarad there and you'll you'll be good. Well, that's that's not so good as far as I'm concerned. So 100 picofarad may be a good starting point, but I use the air variable and sit there and adjust it. It may be anywhere from 50 to 150 picofarads to optimize the slope. I don't know if you can see my hands, but you get yeah. it like so, and it tends to do this or do this if by adding more capacity or less capacitance, and I try to get it, you know, as flat as I can get it. And so by tweaking that value, uh, in my experience of what I've built so far, they varied from probably 75 to 120 picofarads. So I'd say 100 picofarads is, is a good starting point, but if you want to make it better, uh, and by the way, there's an air variable that I saw on Amazon. I think it was only like $12 or something like that, that covers that range really nicely uh, from about, I'm going to say, 75 to 350 picofarads. And, uh, you know, you can sit there and run, a, run the antenna analyzer and then tweak it a little, run it again and until you get it just where you want it and then stick one in that's close to that value. Thank you very much. Sure. And what you're doing is you're eating the leakage inductance of the transformer that's uh, quote inside of the, uh, the balance structure. That I, I, I would not argue that point. I've got a question, Ed. Yes. Roger. Um, what, what, what power level do you typically uh, design these traps for to be able to handle? These, uh, if you, there is nothing on there that prevent what I showed you from running at least 500 watts. Uh, you got 20 gauge wire, which certainly will handle anything. And you, the voltage between one winding and the next is very small. Even if you've got a thousand volts on the ends, you know that that divides down into uh, however many turns you have, and so you don't really have anything to worry about in terms of high voltage. And uh, a twenty gauge wire will carry, uh, you know, quite a few amps. And the capacitors are, uh, you know, one in kV or more, and so. I wouldn't be afraid to run one of those at a, at a kilowatt without any problem at all. Okay. Thank you. Sure. What core uh, materials do you like for, uh, for your balance and unons? Pardon me? What core material do you like? Uh, uh, what you you got to use uh, 43 or K if you're in the amateur band rated range. So you use real, real high, uh, Use a bar. You, they don't. They don't work worth a damn if you if you don't. I mean, I've done it. Uh, you saw pictures. I tested them. 
they just do not work if you don't get some uh, something there that will carry the flux. And the uh, the the low value uh, U, I guess, is the proper uh, term for it. Permeability. If you get a low one. They don't work very well. I've, I've used the uh, 10 and 15 and 20 and uh, the uh, 61 material uh, is okay for about maybe 20 meters and up, but I would, it, it's not very good down at 40 meters. Okay, interesting. A question, um, have you done any work repairing um, traps on existing antennas, not, not home built ones like Mosley antennas or repairing those traps because they typically use aluminum wire also. Well, you know, I've, I've read some stuff about aluminum wire versus uh, copper and, and primarily they are being used for weight reduction. And, uh, you know, the way I'm building them, they're so small that that's really not a factor. If I was building something big like I see on the internet uh, and of course it's easy to use the e easy to build using coax but it's heavy and uh, you know it, I just it doesn't make any sense to me uh, when I when I see what I can do with the tiny one versus the even the ones that I showed you uh, w which were made with coax those are small uh, by ver if, if you compare with what you see on, on, on YouTube, you'll see these hams and they say, use a two and a half inch diameter and put five turns on there. Yeah, these are monsters. And you know, they're out there in the wind. Well, I didn't, I, I, I forgot one thing. My little traps there, when I get them all tuned and set to go, I put shrink tubing on them. And that seals them up. Then you can seal the ends too if you want to. But at least that keeps them pretty much out of the weather and, and makes them very good uh, to be out there in the wind and, and, and bad weather. Pondering. <laughs> Anything else? I've got a question, OPO. Go ahead, Bob. Go ahead, I've got, Bob. I've got the mic. Okay. Um, I uh, let's see. I've I've done some testing to uh, different form of it than you did. My issue is looking for losses. All this conversation about losses on our <laughs> the stuff you hear on the internet. Uh, you know. That's because you're good at blowing them up, Bob. Yeah, that's it. You know, um, I had the, the Valen Designs, and I should, well, it's in the garage, Valen Designs, um, two, a stack two core, and um, it's a four to one. Four to one really gets the impedance uh, or that makes the transformation nice uh, down to uh, one and a half or two to one, so tuner matched that up easily. <clears throat> but uh, the point is, the in case of Valen Designs well, case on the website, they said you can put 1500 watts single tone in that forever. I did it for 40 seconds and the thing exploded. Ed, these, these things, when you're running the 1.5K, 1K or better, or somewhere in that range, there, uh -huh. there's an issue about the capacity of these designs. The only ones that I have found that work were the maxi cores. Uh, by DX Engineering. Now they've recently changed MaxiCore to MaxiCore.2. Art has uh, one or two of those. They're totally different. But I have, when I did some feet, uh, temperature measurements with an IR thermometer, um, the Valen uh, Designs and the Civic one went to 140 degrees. At that point, things were melting. Now, when I put the Valen Design or put it in the MaxiCore, it didn't raise more than about I don't know, maybe three or four degrees above ambient. Now the heat was coming on the balance designs and civic models. I assume it's from the cores being totally saturated. Any comments on that? Yeah, well, I think that's true. The, the core is the, 
weak link there. And if, if you're going to have a, a kilowatt or so, you need some core. And what I was showing with my traps, there is no magnetic core. That's air core. So that's, that's not a factor. When you're talking about the toroids, you're absolutely correct. Uh, you need more core there when you get into the higher power. I mean, that's, that's a given. Uh, the, the ones that I showed with a core, with a, a 43 core, uh, are probably only good for like 500 watts. I would not put them at a kilowatt. I would double the core because they are going to get hot. And in fact, the little one-to-one uh, -one ballon that I showed you with the twisted wire, that's, that's good for like 100 watts. But I have cranked up to like 300, and that thing starts to heat up pretty bad. Well, if you look at the cross-sectional area of that core, it's really small. And so what I plan to do is triple the core in that particular one so I can run up to a couple of 300 watts. Uh, and you're absolutely right. Those cores, you got to have a lot of core there if you're going to pump a lot of power through. No now, the idea I assume there, Ed, is that the more core is the more impedance and therefore less current flowing and in the flux. Is that right? Uh, no, you just... You know, the, the, the amount of flux is, is proportional to the amount of power you're running through there. And so the core has to have the capability of, of handling that much flux. And if it's trying to generate more and there's not enough material there to carry it, that's when it starts heating up. Well, I guess that's where we just can't believe manufacturers' ratings. 5K no, I would, blows up at 1,500 watts. Something's wrong. No, well, if they got two or three cores in there, I'd believe it. But if they don't, I wouldn't. But they got to be real cores, like uh, yeah, in the picture, like like these. They're yeah, two, like, it was like about that size, John. There's two of them uh, in that uh, Pacific and the uh, uh, I don't know it's called Comtech and the Band De uh, Ballon Designs model. Um, when we go to DX Engineering Maxi cores. They're large tubular units, or I think it's like six. Uh, and they would not provide what the winding characteristics was in that thing. I couldn't figure it out, partly because the thing's potted in a, in a, a box. Oh. So, but anyway, the point was that you're right, they need that more ferrite. And that's where the cutting of uh, prices on things like Ballon Designs stripping it down, but they have to they claim right there a sentence in the, on oh, the well. website. You know, yeah, I, 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 have, I have Chinese batteries that claim that they're good for <laughs> for umpteen number of cycles, and they aren't, so. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Oh, you, you've made a good point. You've got to have some core material if you're going to crank up the power. No question about it. Ed, I have a question. Uh, first off, it's great to see everyone, and you're all standing upright and buying green bananas. That's really good to see. Uh, and a question about encasing the uh, ballon. Uh, would you prefer using the black plumbing ABS or the white PVC? You mean to fully pot it? No, to encase the ballon, make it waterproof uh, for an exterior application, outside oh. application. Well, the, the, okay, the, um, the plastic boxes that people use are, are pretty good and they do have a seal. <clears throat> the only thing that some of them don't have is stainless steel screws that would be exposed. And uh, the other thing that, you, that I would recommend would be wherever you make your connector, uh, put a shrink tubing on it or cover it with you know, silicone rubber or something that's really good and waterproof. Uh, I, I think you could use almost any good thing on the outside there to cover up anything that would uh, uh, tend to corrode, you know, your connector or uh, any part of it that's going in and out. 
I don't know if I answered your question or not, but. Uh, yes, to some degree, but I remember years ago, N6B2, <coughs> Tom, Tom Schiller was commenting about placing uh, white PVC in a microwave and turning the microwave on and checking whether the PVC heated and doing the same thing with black ABS like plumbing pipe, which did not heat for the same time period in the microwave. So the answer there, was, or the, the comment there was use black plumbing ABS type of covering for an external ballon uh, secured out of rain, water, whatever. <laughs> Well, I, I, w I would tend to agree with that. Uh, I, th I think that's good advice. That's all I'd say. Yeah, I, ha I, haven't, I haven't had to do that, uh, so I can't speak uh, from my own experience, but uh, I have dealt with one of, one of my big jobs in my 30 years prior was parts, materials, and processes. And so I had a lot of exposure to that type of expertise by guys who made their living at it. And uh, I think you have reiterated a, a proper solution. Can, can I make a comment? This is K6KM. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, um, I, have, uh, I have a vertical um, high gain AV680 and acts like an end fed so it has a it has two transformers one is an anon for adjusting the impedance and the other one is a choke uh, for feed line uh, for common mode and if if i operate in one of the higher uh, uh, sorry on one of the lower bands 80 meters where the bandwidth is very narrow um, the core starts warming up and my swr goes haywire and if you read the small print from the manufacturer, it will tell you the antenna can withstand a kilowatt, but they also tell you that for a second. So mm -hmm. you, you, have to, you have to be cognizant of how much energy you're putting in that core. And once it starts heating up, it starts running off, running, running out, and then it starts heating even more and more. Um, another comment that I wanted to say is that I heard from many people that you actually don't want to enclose these uh, uh, onons, uh, completely seal them because then the temperature problem is even worse. They start cooking inside. You either have to provide them some kind of uh, airflow, or I have a. I was saying that I did the. I made the uh, uh, vertical helical uh, 160, the same one as K6MM made, and I have a. 4.2 inch uh, uh, core diameter, outside, outside diameter choke for the feed line. And I don't have any enclosure. I just uh, uh, leave it out. I only seal the connections to the, uh, to the wire and it's, and it's staying out and I don't have any problem. I, put, uh, I can put a kilowatt in there, no problem. But as soon as you put in an enclosure, you start limiting the airflow and then things go really bad. Let me, let me just uh, put quotes on that. You saw that picture of that little uh, uh, ballon that I showed you with uh, twisted wire. That with a, it'll only handle about 100 watts. It'll actually handle a little more than that. That's not in an enclosure. That's absolutely out in the open. Uh, like you just described, I covered the connections, but otherwise it's, fully exposed and it can get a lot of cooling uh, <laughs> with the wind blowing by. I, let me, you just reminded me of something. Uh, back in the fifties, I worked with a company called uh, Photocon Research Products and they built pressure transducers that were used on uh, rocket engine testing for out there at Rocketdyne. And one of the demonstrations that my boss used to take great pride in he would hold one of these transducers from the cable, put a, a acetylene torch on the diaphragm. And of course, these had a water jacket. They were water cooled. The water was running through that at a pretty good rate. He would put the acetylene torch on there, right on the front of that diaphragm, take it off and then put his finger on it. 
and he wouldn't get even burnt. So when you got something moving by that can carry the heat away, it's amazing how much heat it can do. And I, when I rebuild this one for a little uh, bigger core, it's going to be out in the open. It's not going to be in a box. So I agree with you 100%. Any other Thanks, questions sir. for Ed? Okay, Ed, thank you very much. I appreciate it. My privilege. And uh, if you'd like to stay around and see what kind of craziness we do in the rest of our meeting, you're more than welcome to stay. I'll stay a little while and then I'll probably buzz off and uh, have a little bite. I had okay. a little bite before we started, but uh, I you. didn't really finish. Go All ahead. right, Ed, thank you very much. Thank Thanks, you. Ed. Thanks, Emil.